Hey guys, uh, welcome back to uh, Pickle Tato. Uh, we would like to appreciate you guys, or we do appreciate you guys watching the videos and supporting us up to this point. Um, this next video is going to be the last video of the series. Um, we're going to be releasing some shorts from the stuff that we've already done for the next month or two. Um, we haven't really decided exactly when we're going to be coming back, um, but it shouldn't be too long. Um, but this next video is going to be the last one, like I said, and what, how this happened is throughout the interviews, there was a couple of people that wanted to kind of interview me for it. Um, one of them was Michael Klein that you've seen. He's a bass player. Um, and then the other one is Mark Kenimer. He owns the, uh, Metal Fab shop. I'm sure you've seen those videos. And so how it was going to work out, we were going to, um, it kind of happened at two different times. So when I was doing Michael Klein, it caught me off guard that he wanted to do it. So we went ahead and did about an hour with him. And um, it kind of ran long, and I wanted to get Mark involved, too. So we were going to uh, have both of those guys sit in and um, finish up with me. But uh, for, you know, Michael Klein <laughs> and uh, Mark Kenimer are pretty busy, so it was kind of hard to get their two schedules together. So we just decided to finish up. Since Michael already did a little bit, we're going to finish up with Mark. And uh, like I said, uh, thanks for watching, and we'll start this next interview. Thanks. Off to you. All right. Well, welcome, welcome to uh, Fast Lane. Yeah, glad you're able to come out here and set up. I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, in your video, we were uh, we took some, you know, it was very short, um, probably like five or ten seconds of you know just video stuff that was on the wall and stuff. But I, even with those pictures, I don't think it really did it justice of what you're capable of here. But anyway, anyway thanks for having yeah. us. Yeah, it's about you though. So it's about me. Yeah, yeah shut yeah, up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is the the last one of the first year, first yeah. series. Yep. Yeah. So, um, I did watch a little bit of the first setup. Yeah. I uh, kind of went through all the pre stuff and, uh, I'm glad I know you now. And I, I mean, I probably appreciate it if I would have known you then, but, uh, it seems like you're a more mellow fella of, of these days, you know, <laughs> yeah. so probably that, that's easier a good, to get, good get, assessment. Yep. <laughs> easier to get along with, but, yeah. um, I think he, uh, he let off with, um, you were going in the service. You're going in the Marine Corps. Yep. And what's um, um, where was your first duty station? And uh, tell us a little bit about about your life in the Marine Corps. Sure. You know? what, yeah. What you did. I don't. Yeah. So uh, I think when we left off um, from Michael, he had we were talking about you know what kind of led me into the in, in the military in general, not not so much the Marine Corps, but um. Yeah, the reason I went into the Marine Corps is uh, a lot of stuff I was doing in life really wasn't good, and um, I didn't really see a, a future. School wasn't in in, in the cards, so uh, ended up join, joining the Marine Corps. Really didn't have any idea of much about the Marine Corps. I had some a couple friends that went in, but uh, you know, once they get in, I didn't really keep too much contact. You know, they might come home for three or four days out of a year, so um, didn't really even then didn't learn much about the Marine Corps. <laughs> But anyway, I made the decision to go show up Paris Island April of 92. And uh, that pretty much started <laughs> the career. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I stayed in almost exactly seven years. Um, I was thinking the other day, I thought it might have been closer to eight, but it was it was, it was was seven. Um, but, you know, we can talk about the Marine Corps first if you want, or if you can just talk generally or... Which, yeah, what, what did you do in Marine Corps then? Yeah, so in the Marine Corps, I was a, it was called a scout observer. Um, coming out of boot camp, I didn't, I didn't even know, I, I didn't know so much about the military at all. And what I mean that, <laughs> when you're going to, I had no idea you could pick a job. That, that's how dumb, mm -hmm. dumb I was with it. Uh, I thought, you know, you went to the Marine Corps and you're a Marine, you know, and they just, Give you a gun you know, hey, go do this or whatever. You mm -hmm. know, I didn't have any idea there were different jobs and stuff. That's how, that's how dumb, or dumb I was. And um, so even all through boot camp up to like the last three or four days, like the last three or four days, it's kind of like an out processing. I mean, they're still getting on you a little bit, but you're pretty much graduated. So they're a little bit, you know, the mm -hmm. drill instructors are a little bit nicer to you. So they were talking about um, a guy that I was bunked with. He, he we had a little bit more downtime then. And he's like, uh, so what are you doing after this? I'm like, I don't know. You know, they haven't told me yet. And he's like, well, yeah, well, you probably don't know where you'll be stationed, but you know, what are you going to be doing? What's your job? I'm like, I don't know, whatever they tell me, what do you mean? <laughs> He's like, you don't know what you're going to be doing? I'm like, no, I'm a Marine. What do you mean? You know? Mm -hmm. As, anyway, mm -hmm. it came down, and uh, it's called an 0861 Scout Observer. Basically, it's artillery 
Um, you are the guy that goes out with the infantry and spots bad guys and helps the maneuver, maneuver commander of the uh, infantry battalion. You did it all the way through? Yes. Um, it, you know, I was, started out at Camp Lejeune, and I was there for almost four years. I would have been there the whole time, but uh, I decided to re-enlist, and part of the re-enlistment was they uh, had sent me to Hawaii. But before then, I did a couple floats. Um, if you don't know what a float is, it's basically a six-month deployment on a ship, and usually on the East Coast, you usually do Mediterranean ship you know, floats, mm -hmm. and if you're on the West Coast, as far as Pendleton stuff, you'll do West Packs for six months, you'll... And basically what those are is you get on a ship with a ARG, amphibious ready, readiness group. And it's with a battalion of Marines and they're all on different ships. And um, you basically go to the Mediterranean, you go to each country and you train with the, that country's military for the most part, unless something happens, which I did a couple of times. Um, we were, we got, we got pushed to Bosnia when I was on the, one of them. And then we, after we got done with that for about a, three or four weeks, um, we had got back on the ship and went up to Romania, and we were going to do a training with those guys. And, and usually when you do training with each one of these military groups, you know, you'll pull into the port and you'll get off, and you know, you know it's called Liberty for a couple of days, and you get back on the ship and you'll do your exercise with that military. And then when the exercise is done, you get back on the boat and then you get back in the port for a couple more days. You know, so... Not not only are you doing military exercise, you get to see the country too. You know, so we went everywhere throughout the med. Um, one of them, we was in Romania, and we were just pulling up. Matter of fact, I think they threw the lines off and they were tying everything up, and we were all in our civilian gear, getting ready to get off the ship and go have some fun. And um, you know, the captain comes over the ship and get back on. Says, hey, you know, nobody's going to be released yet. Um, we're going to have to pull out here for a little bit. You know, I'll brief you once we get, you know, get out. And we we're like, well, okay, we're going to do the operation with them first. What's going on? <laughs> so anyway, that's when Somalia happened. Uh, we didn't know at the time. But um, it was, pro you know, they had showed a video of those guys that got shot down in a helicopter. And um Dragged them through the street, hitting them with sticks in the nuts and stuff while they were dead, and pretty much uh, brutalizing the uh, the dead bodies. Um, probably not the best thing to do to show Marines when you're on a ship when you're going there, because when you know we did go, it was a uh, no holds bar. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, good thing for us, bad bad for them. Um, but it, it wasn't the right mindset, you know, looking back on it, probably wasn't the right mindset to be in mm -hmm. um, because we did a lot of stuff probably, um, not that it was illegal or anything, but we, we would have, I would have done things different. So um, anyway, that lasted for a couple, you know, two or three weeks. And then once they had, you know, larger uh, personnel coming in, larger groups, you know, they, they put us back on the ship, and then we went off on our merry way. Was that towards the end? Oh. It was pretty much towards the end. It was, I, I, you know, we from from there, we had went down into the shell back, which me and you talked about in your interview. Um, and then we came back, and I think I think we went to Egypt. Well, that was a change of pace, wasn't it? Yeah. Somalia to yeah. eat the cherry out of the fat dude's belly. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> And then I think we did go to Egypt after that before we went back up to Road of Spain. You know, Road of Spain is usually the, as soon as you get there, you know, you offload, offload all your stuff and they inspect everything. And that's kind of like the start of the circle, you know, Spain, you know, France, Italy, you know, all the way around. Mm -hmm. And then when, when you come back up to, back over to Konos, that's the last place you stop to is Rota. And they take everything off the ship, spray it down, make sure they don't bring anything back to the United States as far as like, you know, mm -hmm. diseases or bad produce or whatever you know they, they just completely strip the ship and make sure it's clean before they bring it back and then you got um it's uh so what after seven years i mean what made you did you want to leave the marine corps or did you just have another opportunity to go out or i didn't really want to leave the marine corps um i was at an age where you had to be a certain age, or you couldn't be past a certain age. And back then, it was very strict. 
And I think it was 26. You know, I can't remember exactly. I mean, if I did the math, but, you know, math's hard. Mm-hmm. So, um, there was a certain age that you had to be, have gone to OCS to be an officer. And, I, you know, I was always a dream to fly for me, and I, I just never thought it was ever possible. And um, when I got back to, actually, when I, was, when I went to Hawaii, I had a, um, no, I'm sorry, let me back up a little bit. As while I was on that, that last med float, um, there was a sergeant on board that uh, one of the first sergeants came up to him. We were on radio watch together, and the uh, first sergeant came in. He's like, hey, Sergeant Dorn, congratulations. I'll never forget his name. I have no idea where he's at, but uh, I remember his name, Sergeant Dorn. Um, first sergeant came up and was like, hey, Sergeant Dorn, congratulations, man. You know, Bubba's shaking his hand. And, you know, he left, and I was kind of like, man, he get promoted or something? What's going on? So I asked him, like, hey, what's going on, man? How, you know, did you get promoted or something? He's like, oh, no, you know, I'm going to flight school. I'm like, <laughs> flight school? I'm like, you're, I you're a sergeant <laughs> in the Marine Corps. How are you going to flight school, you know? And uh, he explained the whole program to me, basically. It's, um, you know, you, you put your package in the Army. You can do it when you're you know, active duty or civilian or whatever. And you go in as a warrant officer. You go to warrant officer candidate school first, and then you go to flight school. But um, he told me the whole process. And I was, even then, I was like, man, you know, I don't even know if I could – they got a, it's called an AFAS test. It's kind of like a ECT of, uh, you know, flying, <laughs> you know, for the Army. Mm-hmm. See if you get the aptitude to be able to learn it. And um, so after that float, you know, when I got got back and was, you know, re-enlist, or, yeah, re-enlisting, everything was so busy. You know, if you're not on a deployment, you're working up to go to a field op, you know, back, you know, at least my MOS. I mean, we were we weren't back at all. You know, if we was back at Lejeune, we were getting ready to go to the field or we were in the field, you know, it was never, never any kind of relaxed time. So to get all that paperwork done, it was a lot of stuff to do. Um, a lot of recommend- recommendations that you had to have. So I just, for one, I didn't think, it, you know, I'd be able to do it. And second, I didn't think I'd have the time to get everything together because it was so much. But, it's one um, way, the way they filter everybody out too, isn't it? Just, that's just what so- I come to th- believe yes mm-hmm. um are you willing to put in time and effort and all the stuff that you got going on in life or, hey we know it's a lot you mm-hmm. know if you're gonna put the time and effort to do it then you probably put the time and effort into flight school right so exactly. um when i did get to lejeune I, i'm sorry when i got stationed uh in hawaii i started putting my package together and uh pretty much had it together for the most part um i was lacking you had to have an army aviator letter of recommendation so being in the Marine Corps, you know, try to find an Army aviator close to you, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, from Lejeune, I guess it could have been Bragg. Um, but to get time off to go up there or to even find, you know, it, it just wasn't going to happen while I was at Lejeune. But, you know, of course in Hawaii they have a um, they have an Army airfield, you know, maybe 30 minutes away from Kanye Bay. At the time, I'm sure it's bad now. You know, traffic must be a lot worse now. But mm-hmm. um, so I called over there. One of my friends in the Marine Corps was dating some girl in the air wing over there at the Army, and and I asked, you know, asked her. I'm like, hey, you know any? But he did me. She's like, well, yeah, I work with all of them. <laughs> so she hooked me up to get my first um, interview with the Army aviator. When I finally got that back, um, within like days, I was going to be deployed to Okinawa. And by the time I got all the paperwork back, <clears throat> excuse me, I was going to go, like you know, like I said, to Okinawa. So I just put this package together, all the stuff that I had, shoved it in an envelope and sent it off. I was like, man, you know, all my records look great. All my scores look great. My recommendations, man, I think I got I might have a good shot at this, you know. And um, so I get over there, and I think within like three or four months, I forget the schedule. It was like every other month they had a board. And by the time I sent it, I wasn't going to make the – it must have been like four months when I found out that I, I didn't get selected. And I'm like, man, what the hell, you know? And um, pretty depressing. And and I was I was coming back too, you know, um, from Okinawa soon. So when I, you know, got back, you know, my wife knew that I didn't get it. And, you know, I was pretty bummed out. And she's like, well – what are you going to do now? Can you reapply? And I'm like, reapply? I mean, they already told me they don't want me, so why would I reapply? You know, kick myself on nuts twice, you know? Mm-hmm. 
And she goes, uh, well, I don't know. It's just kind of weird. I've never seen you give up on something like that. And I'm like, what? Ooh, ooh, <laughs> ouch. So I pretty much had the exa exact same paperwork. I mean, the, all the write-ups and, and everything were the, the same. And with that paperwork, everything had to be within 90 days. Your flight physical, um, letters of recommendations, everything had to be stamped within 90 days. So I had to go back and redo everything, but it was the exact same stuff. I had the same people do the recommendations. They just changed the letterhead and, and signed a different date. It was all the same stuff. But this time, I went to Kinko's, brought all my paperwork. They put it in a nice little binder. They had a glossary, you know, chapter, you know, page one, page three. And it looked Presentation very, is key. very professional. Mm -hmm. So I sent that in and I got selected. Like you said, it was all about the presentation. Mm -hmm. Attention to detail is what they were looking for. And you just then so you, that's where I left. You turn around and hand that to uh, the Marine Corps and say, "I'm out." Well, so part of that package is the Marine Corps agrees that if you do get selected, that they will release you. So you know that obviously they signed the paper saying they'd let me go, so they didn't really have a choice. So there's no there's no time off. Like you went, you took off that uniform and put on. And one gear. day I was standing. In formation in Kaneohe Bay, Hawaii, Hawaii. <laughs> and the next day, I was standing at Fort Rucker, Alabama, at the barracks checking in. And, and they started handing me Army uniforms with all these patches and crap stuff that I had no idea what it was. Mm -hmm. Zero. Hua. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, there was no uh, class beforehand, before the actual um, Warren Officer Candidate class started you know everybody else that i think there, were, there was two of us that were inter service transfers i I went to i was with a guy in the navy i mean him there got there about a week before everybody else um because they gave us all our uniforms and we had to get everything so i just brought this thing up to the laundry i'm like hey just <laughs> whatever you need to put on here let me know because I, I i don't know all or, similar yeah. going from navy to army like that yeah so uh, you went straight into the warrant which is another hell school i mean at yep, first so. yeah it's, uh, I think it's 10 weeks, 12 weeks, if I remember correctly. Um, but, you know, it, it, you know, it wasn't very challenging at all. Matter of fact, um, it was probably the best shape I've been, had been in a long time because, you know, the Marine Corps, when they're doing a physical training, it's, you know, they try to kill you, you know, if you're not about ready to pass out and die, you know, you're not training hard enough. But in that program, in the Army, the Warrant Officer Candidate Program, they start at the very, very basic, you know, it's almost like, you know, the worst out of shape guy in the world, that's where they start. And they build everybody up at the same pace. You know, somebody can be twice as fast as this guy, but they're going to run at this pace. And it's, it was actually a very, very good program. And what I mean by the best shape, usually I was in a lot better shape before, but I was always hurting somewhere. With that program, I didn't hurt the whole time. It was just gradual and uh, it was a lot of mental too, wasn't it? A lot of writing and yeah, organization. It, you know, I, I hate to put it down because you know the army gave me a great opportunity that you know would would have never happened. But for me, the class was a joke. I mean, it was um, it was just it was wasting my time for the most part. I, I went in there thinking. I don't know how the Marine Corps did it. You know, obviously, I wasn't a, a warrant officer or an officer in the Marine Corps, but, um, you know, I thought that they were going to teach you warrant officer skills, <laughs> whatever that means, you know, um, do that transition from enlisted to warrant officer, you know, what's expected of you, you know, what's the, you know, is there any kind of secret rules that you have to know or whatever, but it wasn't, it was, it was like a, it was like a very weak boot camp. Um, you know, roll your socks to six inches and write on little cards and, um, you know, do this physical training that mm -hmm. really wasn't challenging. And um, it, it, it was it was pretty rough. You know, I mean, you got to think, man, you know, man, how old was I? I was mid-20s. You know, I was pretty pretty fired up at that point, you know. And then I go there, and I just see. You probably had some forty-year-old, probably late thirties in there too. Yeah, right? yeah. But even the instructors, you know, I'm thinking of instructors <laughs> as true instructors, and not that these guys were bad guys. It's just it, it was just a total. It's a gentleman's course. It, it was a yeah, but what they would get on you and how they would get on you was kind of like, 
come on, man, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I'd actually, I actually got kicked out. Mm -hmm. I haven't really, you know, said that publicly to too many people, but I got kicked out of the first, you know, when I was going there. <clears throat> and there were, I don't know if I was really kicked out. I'll just tell you what happened. I had a bad taste in my mouth because I was like, you know, this, this is the biggest joke. I thought I was going to, you know, I miss the Marine Corps, you know. And um, I guess they could see my attitude. I mean, I wasn't, I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't, you know, I wasn't. Just you know, bored with it. I really. wasn't back talking to anybody, but they could, they could just tell that, you know, I was like, okay, this is a joke. And every time they would get down and give me 50 or 20 or whatever, well, I'd do 50, you know, or whatever it was. You know, I was just, I would, I would mock everything that they would say because I'm like, you guys are weak, you know. <laughs> smart ass here. Smart ass, yes. That's, and of course, you know, that's typical of my 20 year personality. Um, so they, it must have been about a month in. And I was pretty, I'm like, man, is this how the army is going to be? Am I going to be in this for the rest of my life? I'm like, man, I don't know. I don't know if I can do this. You know, I can't put up with these people. You know, it's just, <laughs> I just wasn't used to that kind of mentality. Anyway, my senior tech officer, um, usually every week they'll bring you in. They'll say, hey, what you're doing wrong, you know, what you could do better, blah, blah, blah. Very rarely will they tell you what you're doing right. So he'd come in, you know, I, I come in there and I, you know, staying attention and he's like, Hey, have a seat, you know, and he's like, Hey, uh, can it, uh, we've noticed that you got a bad attitude and blah, blah. And he just started going on and on. He said, your, your socks were only <laughs> rolled to five and three quarter inches. You know, they're supposed to be six and you didn't write it down on your Diddy card and blah, blah. And he's going all over this mundane, stupidest stuff I've ever heard. And I'm just like, boy. I mean, I didn't say nothing, but I, I could, I know he saw it on my face. Like you're, don't talk to me about my socks, man. You know, <laughs> <laughs> just don't. You can talk to me anything about but these stupid ass socks. And um, I don't know how it got started. I said something, or he said something, and um, I said something about you know, well, that wouldn't, that's not how it's done in the Marine Corps, or something like that, something to that extent. Well, he jumps out of his seat and starts putting his finger in my face. If you want to go back to Marine Corps, we'll make that happen. Well, I stand up too. And I had some choice words in my fingers back in his face. And I was like, don't you ever put your finger in my face. I said, I'll break you in half, son. I mean, I was just, you know, you got this kid that's supposed to be in his course and here I am talking to this instructor like that, which was totally. And going back to old totally school. Totally unprofessional. I mean, I it was, that was all me. It was my fault. That was, I should have never done that. That was, but, you know, I can't go back and, and you know, take things back. So I got in his face pretty good, and when I did that, I think he shit his pants. Um, so he called on all these other guys to come in there, and they came in there, and I was like, "Hey, let's do it, all three of you." I mean, I, I said, "I'll, <laughs> I'll take it." You know, mm -hmm. it just it, it didn't turn out good. So he's, you know, I basically he said, "Well, if you want to go back to the Marine Corps, we'll make that happen." I'm like, "Fine, I'm out." He's like, "Get back up," and he said, "You're going over to the different barracks." So the heated conversation ended with me going to a different barracks, and I was getting. I was going to be processed out. Well, they had, you know, the commander of that school at the time was a, a W-4. Um, and there wasn't very many back then. And I'm not even, I think they had just made a W-5 rank. I don't even know if it was out yet, but, you know, it used to be up to W-4. Now it's a CW-5. But um, he was the commander of that school. And um, so I'm sitting in my barracks and it was, I don't know if I was there for the day. Yeah, I was there for the day. And I hadn't called my wife yet to let her know what was going on. Um, I was just, you know, seeing how it played out and when, where I was going to go, if I was going back to Lejeune or how that was going to, where I was going to get all the answers, <clears throat> excuse me, before I called. So the next morning, uh, when I say barracks, um, you know, they're like, little, there were rooms where I was, um, where they had sent me. So anyway, somebody knocks on the door, open the door and here's that CW4. He's like, hey, hey, Bill, hey, hey, you mind if I come in and have a talk? And I'm like, Bill, I'm like, <laughs> oh, yeah, sure, sir, come on in, you know. So he comes in, and we just, he was very, very chilled out, you know, relaxed. I mean, if I was him, I would have been chewing my butt. That's, you know, but he. He knew how to approach you, though. He did. And um, he's like, you know, hey, you, you know, if this is something you want, you know, we're going to make this happen for you, you know. This ain't for everybody and blah, 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 blah. He's like, you sure that's what you really want to do? I'm like, well, yes, sir. I, I, you know, I guess this just isn't going to be for me. You know, I just, it's just two different worlds, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to adjust or not. 
And he's like, yeah, I can understand that. I can understand that. He's like, hey, uh, have, you call, have you called your family yet? I'm like, well, no, sir. He's like, well, have you thought about what your wife's going to say? I'm like, hmm. I'm like, well, yeah, kind of, but you know, she's going to, you know, she'll support me anyway. He's like, well, okay. Well, you know, you've done a lot of work to get to this point. You know, I would hate for you, you know, to upset that you're all's plans. He said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you to the rest of the day. If you don't show up tomorrow by eight o'clock in the barracks over there, he said, I'm going to assume that you want to go back in the Marine Corps, but if not, we're going to give you another chance. He said, but if you do anything like that again, he said, you're immediately out for the rest of your life. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, all right. I appreciate that. And of, of course, I went back the next day. And, Some people. And, it, you know, I didn't give anybody any lip. I did exactly what they said with a smile on my face. And I was like, man, I got it. four more weeks to go to flight school. You know what I mean? Anybody can do this stupid shit for four weeks. Yeah. Uh, and so I got done with that and then started flight school. Yeah. You enjoy flight school? Cool. Loved it, man. It I didn't was, know that was your, your lifetime dream to fly. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, even as a kid, I mean, I remember looking in my backyard, looking at planes flying by. I'm like, man, how in the world? And then when I was in the Marine Corps, I was around a lot of F-16, you know, fighter pilots and mm -hmm. helicopter pilots. And being a scout, I'd gone up in a Huey a couple times to, you know, do um, missions with those guys. So as long as you was in the air, you didn't care if it was fixed wing or didn't care. Or, yep. And I And even, you know— even being in that helicopter, I was just watching watching their hands, and I'm like, man, how are they doing this? You know, <laughs> I just didn't understand how it worked or, or anything, so I was just always fascinated with it. And, um, yeah, yeah, flight school was great. I had a bunch of great people I went to flight school with. Um, still know a lot of them to this day. Did you um, So where did you go after flight school? Where did you stationed at then? Yes, yeah, so after flight school, I went to um, Fort Hood. So it was in Fort Hood, and while I was at Fort Hood is when nine eleven happened, and um, of course you know that changed the world. And we had gone, we were on our way to go to Germany. We we're going to be, we had a, the unit was going through a program at Fort Hood. It was about eight, six to eight months long, and they were when you go from Alpha Model Apaches to D Mental Apaches. Your whole unit goes to this to Fort Hood, and they do a train up to make sure that you guys understand the differences and how to employ a D model rather than Alpha. So, so when you left flight school, how did they pick what kind of helo you're going to fly? Well, you know, which was another cool thing. Um, it used to be by by merit, meaning, say you have thirty people in your people in your class. Where the army says we need five or two Chinooks. 20 Blackhawks, three Apaches, you know, a couple of or whatever. They'll, they'll have a breakdown of what, what the Army needs. And then, according to your rank in your class, like the number guy, like, what do you want? He's like, well, I want Chinooks. Number two would be like, I want that. And so, rank being not rank, but uh, what, how you scored in class. Yeah, th the whole time that you've been going through flight school, they keep track of every check ride, every test, every PT test, everything that you've done, all these points accumulate. Mm -hmm. And at the end, you'll have a, you know, a score. And basically, that's what line, where your rank is, how you're going. Now, some people, you know, if they wanted a Chinook and they busted their butt and they were number one, there could have been a whole class of 30 Apaches. You just never know. <laughs> it's the Army needs first, which, you know, it should be. Mm -hmm. But um, I got lucky enough. I think it was like number three or four in my class. Um and there was only two Apache spots. And back in those days, I'm not sure how it is now, but before 9-11, um, nobody wanted to fly Apaches and because they were always in the field. You know, you always, you know, learn to f fly is one thing, but with an Apache, it's a, you have to learn a whole nother <laughs> gamut, you know, all the weapon systems and how all that stuff works. So a lot of people just want to go fly Blackhawks, you know, and, hey, just wiggle sticks and fly people around. Well, from bef before I even went to flight school, I was like, I don't know if I'm flying an Apache. You know, if I'm going to be flying up in air in combat, I want to be able to shoot back at something. You know, I don't want to rely bullets. on some uh, guy in, with a, you know, a saw or something in the back seat, and he's shooting. I'm like, well, <laughs> I'm just, you know, sit up here in the sky not doing anything. So I always want to, I always want I knew I was going to fly Apaches. Um, but anyway, so I got my pick, and that's, that's how. So it's it's unfolded perfectly so far. Yep. I mean, a little couple of little hiccups, but 
So you get to uh, you get to there and you fly on Apaches and um, oh, you you're in Germany though, right? Uh, so I went so we went to Fort Hood from from flight school, and the reason I went to Fort Hood is because that unit from Germany had folded up their colors and because they were um, getting they were getting D models. So they took everybody, you know, put them in different units, and they brought the colors back to Fort Hood, and then they formed back up at Hood. So they took everybody from, you know, 101st, Bragg, you know, all of these different units and very few people out of flight school, and they put them in this unit. And that buildup was for like a couple months until they got everybody there. And once everybody got there, then they started the train up, which is which is about six to seven months. And basically they take, like I was saying before, <clears throat> they teach you – all you old guys have been flying alpha models for this, you know, we know that you're deed model qualified now, but here's how you fight it as a unit. And that's what that train up is at, is at Fort Hood. So we knew we were always going to go back to Germany after we got done doing our train up. But we ended up being there, at least my family was there for almost a year because we got there before they, even, you know, even built a unit back up. But, um, yeah, so 9 it happened. About the same time, within a couple of months, we were going to go, you know, back to Germany. And so when we got to Germany, we were there for maybe four or five months. And the startup of yep, start up. Iraq. Yep, OF. Mm. So I think we got to Kuwait January time frame of 03. And of course, you know, if March. you don't know, March is when, yep. when it kicked off. I would have, um, so it was, uh, you got any good overseas Apache stories? I mean, yeah, um, stands out. Well, you know, rather than going through the whole story, uh, you know, if anybody's really interested, there they had a they made a documentary about the unit I was in. Um, it's called Apache Warrior. It used to be out in theaters. Um, then it went to Netflix for a while. And I believe it's on YouTube now. It's free on YouTube. So if anybody want to wants to or interested in how all that stuff happened, you know, it's like a two hour thing. So it's <laughs> rather than me go through everything, um, you know, you watch that and 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 it's it's about ninety percent accurate. And of course, you got you it's Patchy Patchy Warrior. Patchy yeah. Warrior. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they, they, so it's basically just a documentary of of the very first D model Apache unit. And they come back and talk to you about. Different things. To yeah, there was a guy that I, who was our, one of my crew chiefs, um, he had gotten out and he went to film school and he went out to California and he wanted to become big. Well, he got with somebody out there, Gravitas Ventures. Um, they do a lot of, you know, documentaries and stuff like that. And he had told them about our unit, the unit he was in. So they ended up talking to me and a bunch of people that were in that debacle. So, um, yeah, so um, some of the stories from that is, you know, we basically the very first mission that we did coming out of Kuwait, we take out, we took off and got turned back around because the weather went bad, and um, so the second mission that we did, we took off and we were supposed to go to Baghdad later that night. So we were we were jumping from Kuwait to where our fob was it was about halfway between Kuwait and Baghdad. And when we got there, we're supposed to refuel and get ready for the night mission to go just south of Baghdad to kill some artillery pieces that supposedly had chemical weapons in them that they were shooting. And um, the whole mission just, you know, <laughs> didn't turn out very well. There was a lot of signs that were telling us not to go. Um, there were some abort criteria. You know, abort criteria is basically if this happens, you don't go. So we had like five or six different abort criteria. Well, if that happens, you know, we scrapped the mission. Well, all those things happen when we still ended up going. Not that I, you know, not not that I, you know, I wouldn't want to get in a fight or anything like that, but, you know, if you're going to do it, why are you going to risk a battalion or two or three worth of Apaches to some intel that had you knew was incorrect, but we still went anyway. So anyway, it, it, gave, it gave me uh, my first, my first, um, look at senior army leadership and how in my mind it wasn't anything like the Marine Corps. And I was like, these guys are going to kill me. You know what I mean? These guys, these guys are clueless. Um, 
that's that's how I looked at it at the time. One of our commanders at the time, about a year later, well, two years later, ended up getting getting promoted to one star general, and he was in charge of the making that decision. So anyway, mm -hmm. so yeah, a lot of bad taste in my mouth coming out of that deployment, not with the guys, and it all had to basically do with that one one mission. I was like, okay, if these guys are willing to do something this stupid, I mean, what else are they going to be having us doing? But at the same time, our unit started having a different mindset. You know, you got to remember, you know, this was, you know, last time they had a fight like this with helicopters was Vietnam. And all those guys who had learned those lessons in Vietnam really weren't around. I think we had one guy in our whole regiment that was a Vietnam vet. And, um, you know, talking about running and diving fire, which we did not do at the time. That was hot dog in the aircraft if you did that kind of stuff back then. Um, so we didn't learn a lot of the techniques with the kind of environment that we were going to be fighting. And, and we, got our, we got our asses handed to us, you know, with a bunch of guys on the ground with AKs <laughs> and, uh, and uh, RPGs. And they did have some anti-artillery, but there was, was nothing guided, um, which, you know, we got, you know, a, a, every helicopter went out that night, either crashed or got tore up pretty good. So it, it was a mess. Um, yeah, that was, that was just, that was just one mission out of, but that was by far the worst one. How many, did you do more than one rotation over there? No, the, so the, you know, we were told we were going to be there for three months. You know, obviously the Army has to has to do their deployments and get all the units in sync, you know, so, we're, so we were going to be there for three months, you know, leave, and then other guys were going to come and replace us for six months, and then we were going to come and replace them. All three months goes by, and all these units starts going back to Kuwait, and um, like, okay, what's going on? You know, when are, when are we supposed to be going back? And so about the three-month mark, they said, hey, you know, we found out where we're going. And we're like, where are we going? Aren't we going back to Kuwait? And they're like, oh, no, you're going to a place called Balad. Balad? Where the hell is that? So we look at the map. Well, that's north of Baghdad. We're like, wait a minute. We're supposed to be going the other way. <laughs> Why are we going up here? <laughs> well, you know, so there's you know, a banded airfield. You know, that's where they used to – that was, um, you know, pretty pretty big, uh, very long uh, airstrip. Uh, the facilities were there, but you know, like I said, they were abandoned. So we thought we were going to be there for about a month or two just to wait, you know, because Kuwait was pretty pretty stacked up with people um, getting out and re rotating and everything. So we we thought we were just waiting our turn. And right before the six month mark, they do a change of command with our regimental commander, <clears throat> and he goes, "Hey guys, we're going to." As he's leaving, he goes, "Hey." We're going to see you soon. I hate to leave you guys. You know, I want to finish this out with you. But, hey, I'm going to see you back in Germany real soon. Well, he leaves. The next day, you know, well, they do the change of command. So this guy comes and does, you know, his speech to everybody. He gets everybody out, you know, once they do a change of command. He's like, hey, guys, I've got great news. Hey, we're going to be here for six more months. You know, I'm going to be there. And everybody's just like, what? What did you just say? So the guy leaving was like, hey, I'm going to see you soon, making us think that we're going to be leaving and then you, so you know, he had to have known what this guy was getting ready to say. I mean, you know, it's not like they don't talk. So this new new guy comes out and he's like, "Hey, buckle in, you know, give me another good hard six months." Like, listen, son, bitch, you only like you've been here for a day. You tell me, you know what I mean? Um, there's a reason special ops does short deployments because the deployments over there for us was, you know, very very tasking. I mean, I would be flying six seven, eight hours a day sometimes, you know, just about every day. Um, and, you know, it doesn't sound like much, but go out there when you, know, when you got rounds going over your head or you're following convoys and they're getting shot up and you get, you know, it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty taxing. And by the time you get back, you're wore out. We didn't have air conditioner in our tent for a long time. So you go back and try to get some sleep and you're just dying, you know, and then, you know, eight hours later, you, if you were asleep, you would go back and go back and jump in another aircraft and do it all over. Kind of look forward to get back in the air conditioned aircraft. Exactly. You know, all those dumbasses from flight school. Yeah, fly Apaches. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, 
I was flying with those guys out there and they were dying. You know, mm -hmm. I met a, you know, saw a couple of my flight school guys that were in Blackhawks and, hey man, gotta go sit in your car. I'm like, no, no, <laughs> you're not rated. <laughs> so yeah, and I think the air conditioning that thing worked very, very well. I mean, it wasn't freezing, but it would keep it, you know, if it was 120, 130 out, it would keep it with 80, you know. Air conditioning had the tunes rolling probably. Well, there wasn't no tunes, but, mm. um, <laughs> but yeah. I mean, it, it was it was comfortable, but, you know, you still had all your armor stuff on. I mean, it was, you know, you, you, were, you were wore out by the time you, and towards about the middle of that deployment, I started getting real bad, um, you know, my back was always sore, and there there'd be times where those crew chiefs would have to come out and, you know, kind of like pull my legs out and get them back up on the on the side. And let me kind of like stretch out a little bit mm -hmm. before I actually get off. So uh, it, it's hard on the body, especially for somebody. You know, I'm I was six, you know, six three, and uh, being in the front seat, six three is pretty tall. In the back seat, when I'm flying back there, it wasn't too bad, <clears throat> but even then. When you're flying, you know, my head was always still down like this while I'm flying. So, you know, if you were flying at night, you had nods on your head. So all that weight in your neck's like this. It's just, you know, it's just taxing on, on, on the body. But, um, yeah, so that, that was probably the best story from, from that deployment. And uh, how many years did you uh, total do to retire? So I did 20. I did seven on the Marine Corps, and then I retired. You got out right at 20. I, if they would have let me out at 15, I would have got out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, you know, I love the people that I, was, that, I, that I served with, and that's what it was all about, you know, protecting and being protected by your friends and comrades. Um, the leadership never really got any much better for me. Um, just about every, you know, I went in. I just couldn't believe that some of these guys were in charge of <laughs> warriors, you know. Um, you know, everybody's going to make mistakes and make bad decisions, but um, when you make them several, several times and do several, several things and they still serve out their full command, um, for whatever reason, you know, it, it just it didn't work like that when I was in the Marine Corps, you know. I didn't have one bad commander when I was in the Marine Corps, ever. Um, I know it's probably a lot different now from what I've heard, but when I was in, you had some bad lieutenants, but they never made company commander. You know, they were kind of, you know, go do S3 stuff or do whatever, and they'll eventually learn, hey, you probably need to get out and do something else. Um, so I, I never really saw any really bad commanders. You had better than others, but never... Mm -hmm. Never a shit bag like some of the ones that were in the army. So, um, so that's why I got out very the, the second I could. Um, not that I don't appreciate the great opportunity they gave me. Um, I mean, I never would have been able to do something like that one for the army. So, extremely appreciative. Um, but it was time to go. It was time to go. And your last, uh, the last duty station was. So was I was it? down at uh, Fort Rucker. I was working at. Um, Basically, I wrote the new eight. You have an air crew training manual. The book is about you know about that high, <laughs> and it's it's what every aviator is trained to. Every standard that they're trained to for every maneuver, any kind of weapons and get you know anything, any flight task, anything. Um, that's what they're held. So when they go do a check ride every year, you know you you are expected to know what that standard is and be able to do it, whether it's be flying or <clears throat> academic. So I basically spent a year and a half, two years rewriting that aircrew training manual before I left. Kind of turns you into a subject matter expert on the... Well, I had some severe back problems at the time. Um, so they let me go to Fort Rucker to basically get my surgery and retire, which is, you know, very appreciative again. Um, so when I did get there, I scheduled uh, my surgery at Walter Reed. And in between those times that I was doing that manual stuff, they let me get my back all fixed by the time I got out. And uh, so you get out and uh, you're not ready to retire, retire. You still got life in you. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll never probably fully retire. Um, you know, first I'd drive my family nuts if I did. But, I'm, you know, 
besides that, I like stuff too much, <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> I like having toys and everything. So, you know, it's 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 been we've been pretty blessed as far as um, being able to get what you know be successful in what we're doing. So it'd be uh so kind of back up to uh, current life now. So when you retired, you you found a position within what you were doing. Yeah, not really. Um, so when I was when I was down at Rucker, you know, a lot of a lot of the aviators see Huntsville as the place to go to retire because that's where the a lot of the uh, well, that's where every aviation, you know, you have a program management office for each airframe, and all those are in Huntsville. So I knew if I was going to go anywhere, the best odds of me getting a halfway decent job would be here in Huntsville. So. Before I even left down at Rucker, I'd we'd planned on moving up here. We had some land. Well, man, we must have looked at 50, 60 houses, all kinds of different land. Just never could find anything that that we really wanted. So we ended up just building. And so we had that. We started building that house before I even retired and was hoping that I had a job when I got up here. Um, so when I started, I was supposed to be flying with something similar to, to in the Apache community. And um, when I got up here, it didn't work out like it should have. I, I wasn't told some things <laughs> that I want to get into right now because it's a long story. But uh, by the time I got up here to, to do that job, it wasn't available for me. They said, well, it's going to be in there three months. And I'm like, listen, I ain't got three months. You all said, I told you when I, when I was retiring, you know, I, he's like, well, let me try to find something else to hold you over, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, yeah, you know, help me out here. <laughs> you know, I got, mm -hmm. I got uh, two house payments and, you know, now I'm retired. I don't have another income other than retirement. So uh, he probably looked for about a day or two, this guy. He's like, hey, man, hey, uh, can't really find nothing for you, you know, but hey, you know, the spot's going to be for you, you know on on such and such date and i'm like okay so a friend of mine worked at a, a tech company here locally and i called him i told him the situation he's like man we really don't have nothing here right now he said but hey i'm gonna talk to my boss he said that's pretty screwed up let me, let me talk to my boss and see if we can find something i'm like okay so he called me back maybe an hour or two later he's like hey can you come in monday you know and i'm like yeah sure well i go on monday and i'd go talk to probably six or seven different people i had you know, the job I had, they was like, oh, yeah, come on. You know, these guys, I had to go. I mean, it was people in suits and stuff. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, a bunch of different people I had to see. Well, by the time the interview, I, you know, was over, I'm like, man, that was uh, that was pretty rough. And um, so anyway, they ended up calling me the next day and said, hey, hey, if you want the job, here's your salary. If you, you accept it and start Monday or whatever day it was. I'm like, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So... I started, that started my um, UAV career, um, unmanned aircraft stuff. And these guys were doing, you know, stuff w with these airframes that were pretty new at the time and, and probably still are. So a lot of classified stuff that, that we dealt with. By the time I ended up, you know, it was supposed to be like a three-month thing there, and they knew that. But So I was kind of like running some of their programs. Well, when that three months comes by, and I told, you know, the guy that I was supposed to go back to work for, he calls me up. I hadn't heard from him the entire time. So like on a Thursday, he's, he calls me up. He's like, hey, man, uh, you going to be ready to start Monday? I'm like, uh, yeah, I think so. He's like, what, what do you mean? I was like, well, you know, yeah, we'll, we'll see how it goes. You know, let me call you back. Uh, you know, tomorrow, tomorrow, you know, we'll figure out what time and everything. He's like, yeah, okay, give me a call. So I go tell my boss that I was working at, and he, he was pretty high in the company. And I told him, I said, hey, you know, just want you to know, hey, I appreciate the opportunity you guys gave me. You know, you really helped me out in the bind. And he goes, how would you like to stay here permanently? I'm like, man, I would love it, you know, because I loved what we were doing. I mean, we were, we were into some stuff that I didn't even know <laughs> existed. And we were working on not just UAV projects, but some other projects where we had some equipment that I, I'm like, how did you all get this here without anybody seeing us? So it, <laughs> some pretty wild stuff. I mean, so it really intrigued me. 
So anyway, I was there for about three years, and by the time I left, I was running one, two, three, four, about four different labs doing four different projects in two different areas, and um, totally enjoyed it. So you still had uh, probably former senior Army officers running everything having no with no this was a totally i mean there there was one one senior army guy and he was more of like an hr guy but he was like the head of the hr guy kind of thing you know this was all engineers and all the bosses were engineers i'm talking I mean, extremely bright people way smarter than me and what i brought to the table was basically just organizational skills keeping everybody in line making sure they're supposed to be doing what they're doing making sure this project's on time hey do you, what are you missing here? Why were you here yesterday? <laughs> you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. It was just managing all these large scale projects and everything that that has to deal with. I mean, you name it. Um, no, no change from from then to now. I mean, you're still doing similar to same. No, so so I was there for like three years, and at the time, a lot of the work started drying up. You know, all the projects were getting completed, and they were still waiting on some things to come in, and You know, the way it works, mostly around here in town, you have you have to charge your time to a project. You know, although you work for company A, you're not you're not usually charging your time to an overhead account. You're charging your time to whatever project you're working on. So if there's no projects to be working on, you can't really charge your time to. Now they'll hold you on overhead for a while, but unless something starts coming in, you know they're Going to be like, hey, man, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> we could put you kind of like lay off for three or four months or whatever it was. So I kind of saw the right, nobody, you know, nobody, I talked to my boss a couple times. I'm like, hey, when's this stuff going to come in? He's like, well, you know, we just really don't know right now, Bill. And I'm like, well, what's going to happen to me? He's like, well, you know, you know, we're going to keep you, you know, as long as we can. I'm like, well, you know, so they never really would give me a straight answer, you know. Of what, comfortable. Was, yeah. what was going to happen. And so I was at lunch with one, a couple of my friends one day, and one of my old battalion commanders was in the same spot. And he sees me, and he's like, hey, Bill, what's going on? Bro? Hey, what's going on, sir? You know, and he's like, uh, hey, uh, I got a great opportunity, you know, if you're, if you, if you're looking for something. Um, and I'm like, well, how? I'm like, did somebody, I like, did somebody tell you something? He's like, no, no, you know, I, I had the thing just popped up. I, you know, see if you, you know, if you're interested, let me, you know, give me a call. So, got a hold of him. It was basically flying, flying um, MD five thirty F pluses over in Saudi Arabia, basically teaching their special forces how to fly little birds, which ended up being H H six I's from Boeing. Um, so I did that. It was supposed to be a year. I think I was there for about four months, five months. And came back. There was uh, some stuff that had happened over there that uh, wasn't cool, so I bailed. Um, the company that I went over there to work for put me in a very bad situation. I was like, "Hey, man, I'm out. <laughs> you got this amount of time to fix this," and which was a lot. I gave them about a month, and about every week I called back. I'm like, "Hey." Anyway, one thing after another kept on happening, and 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 the company wasn't doing. They're into the deal, so I left. And then I started working at a Redstone Test Center. Um, Doing a lot of projects there. Um, I was basically an account manager there with um, a bunch of different projects. So basically anything, anybody that wants to come do any kind of testing with a certain, a certain equipment, you know, they'll come to me, hey, we need vibe tests, we need shock and vibe, we need temp, whatever. Whatever testing is going to be, um, they come to me, I schedule it all out, make sure it all gets done, and uh, send them on our way. Did, then, that, did that for three years, and then an opportunity came with uh, the program management office with Apaches here. It was a real good friend of mine, and um, I've been there ever since. Pretty good connections that you built up along the way. and Yeah, yeah. everybody pretty much knows everybody for the most part, and if you don't know them, somebody does know them that you know, so I mean, it's... Pretty tight community, but you know, the older you get, <clears throat> you know, you know all the old people. You don't know <laughs> all, the, <laughs> all the guys that are coming in. Um, 
So I think that's by design. By the time you get done retiring, hey, it's time for you to go. You know, get some new people in here. And you're, uh, so you built that house out there and people started intruding around you. Yeah, we built you a house. To, you had to know that was going to happen, though, right? Oh, I knew it was going to happen. <laughs> and, um, matter of fact, I wanted, I wanted a lot of, I wanted a lot of land with a house in the middle of it was a bunch of trees that, you know, you couldn't even see. And, um, when we first moved up here. <clears throat> well, the the job I thought I was going to have when I first got up here was going to have me gone all the time. So, you know, my wife did not want to be, you know, she's from the city for the most part. You know, she didn't want to be in the backwoods all by herself. So <clears throat> I agreed to go in the subdivision, but the subdivision wasn't completely built. Matter of fact, it was on the last phase that they wasn't even selling properties yet. But when I went and looked at there, I'm like, I want that way back there and they're like oh we're, we're not selling those yet and I'm like well then I'm not buying nothing he's like oh well, we got stuff that's already here I'm like either I'm buying that or uh, I'm going somewhere else so they let me build back there and we were back there by ourselves for a good two or three years and at that time the housing was kind of slow um, so it really wasn't that bad but onesies and twosies started popping around you know and I would always tell the builder, I'm like, hey man, you need to tell these people, don't be <laughs> don't be buying this lot next to me. They can stay, they can go over there, don't come around here. And he would laugh. He's like, Man, I tell him, I tell him. And uh it just eventually started getting closer and closer. And I told Carrie, you know, told my wife, I was like, when they put stakes next door to this lot next, I said, We're out. She's like, Yeah, I agree. It's pull up one day. Time to get out. And I pull up after work one day and I seen little yellow markers in there. I was like, Hey, let's call my buddy. And I was like, Hey, put this house up for sale. <laughs> And then and we were out within six months, I think. I mean, it was it was, it was pretty quick. And then you come out to this county life. I come out here to county life, yeah. It's your uh, uh, nice place. Yeah. I heard you throw a lot of good parties, too. Right? Some we, bands. We've and, been known to fl throw some parties out there. Um, you know, when I, when I say parties, it is, you know, everybody thinks of knockdown, drag out, you know, wild people, blah, blah, you know. Mm -hmm. Nobody comes to my house that I don't know and can trust. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you're going to have a good time, but you're going to you're gonna be, be respectful to everybody that's there, you know? And 99% of the time, it's always been that way. I've never had to get, you know, never had to say anything to anybody. Everybody that comes out there knows the rules, they, you know, or you know, nobody crazy. Now it gets pretty, it gets fun there. We have a lot of, you know, a lot of bands all the time. Um, Usually every weekend, with, you know, the football game, we have football game parties. Um, good food. Good food. So, mm -hmm. just wanted to have an atmosphere where everybody could feel relaxed and have a good time, you know. You know, not like, you know, at the golf course where everybody's all uptight, you know. This is a hang out with your buddies. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Feel and free to do whatever you want within reason. And the uh, and you got this love of for uh, automobiles, cars, trucks. <laughs> Yeah, like we talked on the you know podcast when you yeah. when you were on there that um I'm not I can't remember if we went in, in too deep on how that whole truck thing happened, but yeah. anyway it was basically you know my dad had a truck like that <clears throat> and after he passed away um, I still had it while I was in the Marine Corps and anyway it ended up getting taken away from me <laughs> I just stole it from me kind of and I never could find it again after that so after a long time trying to find it never could so I just <clears throat> found one. Here locally, kind of, it was about 45 minutes away, and it was basically in pieces. I think it had the cab on it for the most part, and it had stuff mocked up, but it wasn't, you know, wasn't together at all. Um, so we started that project. And oddly enough, that was right when COVID happened. So during COVID, a lot of people was working from home. So I was able to get a lot of stuff done at the house. Um, you know, obviously working at the same time, but, you know, as soon as you get off work, I mean, you're there. So there ain't no time, you know, driving home, getting dinner, you know, now I'm more out, you know, spend an hour or two in the garage. Well, as soon as I was done with work at the house, you know, I'm in the garage. Mm -hmm. Or during my lunch breaks, you know, I was True. out there. Yeah. So yeah. we got it done a lot quicker than, and it really, you know, it's never going to be done, but it got to a point where I could drive it pretty quickly, which is all I really wanted anyway. Yeah. It well, looks good. Yeah. You got the, that's just one the most precious vehicle. You've had a ton of vehicles. Oh, yeah, we've had a lot of vehicles. And the only reason, you know, it's not like, um, 
we got this pile of money sitting anywhere and I'm just buying anything I want. You know, everything I've bought has been a purpose. Um, you know, I usually don't buy anything unless I get a great deal on it, you know, and I'll drive it for three months, six months or however long. And then usually by the time I sell, I'm, I'm making a profit. So I kind of, kind of started a business out of it. Um, and that's what I've been doing, you know, on the side for the last couple of years. Yeah. You pulled up here, uh, in a Maserati. Yeah. Maserati. Yeah. I was like, who is this guy? <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> Want to work on this truck. <laughs> yeah. We had a lot of, a lot of pretty cool cars so far. Um, that's kind of tempered down a little bit because of the economy. <clears throat> I don't want to get, you know, I want to see what's going on. You know, the, the used car market is going to take a hit and I don't mind it taking a hit because I think things are out, are out of control anyway, but I don't want to get stuck with anything when it takes a hit. So I'm kind of backing off a little bit and kind of seeing what happens, let these prices get back to normal. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a couple things already that I have now that I need to get rid of before I start jumping back into it. We had bought a pretty nice RV that was a lot of money, but I got such a great deal on it, I couldn't pass it up, so I ended up getting it. And um, and of course, it was right before winter. And uh, there was some stuff I wanted to get done to it before I sold it. So that's where it's been for the last couple of months. Real reputable shop that takes their time, and so they're they're doing a bunch of work for me. I want to make sure it's um, absolutely up to speed before I sell it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could tell people what was wrong with it, you know, and it was nothing major, it was just little things here and there. But I was like, well, I want this thing perfect, so I gave them a whole list of up, up to lights, you know. This little light in the back was, you know, replace that bulb. So it was. Pretty good punch list I, I had for him, so that's why it's been taking so long. You know. Yeah, it's nice, too. Yeah, yeah. I'll be selling that thing, too, uh, at some point, probably in the spring. Every, Maybe. I mean, every purchase is uh, re prepared to resell it at any time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, I've, except for recently. <laughs> I haven't bought anything that, uh, that I didn't think I got a good deal on. Um there was one instance where that happened recently that, you know, that uh, wasn't a great deal, but, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of that too, though. Yeah, still a nice car, though. Yeah, yeah, it is my car. So it's a very, very solid car. Um, I'm happy with it. It's just um, I'm at to the point where it's just time for it to go, mm -hmm. you know, so. But, um. Is there anything else that you'd like to put out there that we don't know about or we mm. couldn't even ask you about, you know? Uh, no, nothing I can think of, man. I think we pretty much covered everything. If not, like I said, we're going to be doing, we're going to be doing multiples of these, hopefully. So what, yeah, what's your, uh, what's the plan for the next season? This Well, we've got some plans but they're really not set in stone. We want to go travel a little bit. Um, you know, I got friends all through the United States. Um, I want to take two or three weeks, maybe, uh, pack up me and the, and the gear and the guys that run the thing um, and just go hit different states and visit all these people. And if I see anybody on the way, stop them, and just having conversations with people. It'd be pretty cool. There's a lot of stories that uh, nobody knows about. and you know, Yeah, you know. and, you know, the people that we've had so far, yourself including, uh, unfortunately, this was done at the beginning of this this podcast. Um, so, all the way, we've had some great success, especially with, the, you know, the shorts that we've been put out. Um, I think if it ever, you know, when it when if and when it ever does get bigger than it is right now, I just hope people will go back and watch the interviews that I've already done because I think you know we got some great interviews that we, we've done so far. Mm. So, um, and you know, we're not trying to be millionaires, not trying to you know be the biggest and best thing out there. As, you know, as long as we enjoy what we're doing. Did you? Did you? Um, did you tell everybody maybe the reason why you started it? Or yeah, or? I think I brought that up a couple different times. Um, if, if I if I haven't, you know, basically I got I was a, in a <laughs> sitting in a hospital bed, thinking you know, uh, 
you know, I got I got a lot of good friends. I've got some great stories, and but you know, I just want to get it on record. You know, um, meaning record, meaning you know, I know this guy, and I know some of the great things that he's done and been through, and blah blah blah. I bet you anybody walking around just walk right by him, not even know, which you know we all do. Mm-hmm. So I just want to get these people, that, you know, on video, so it'll be out there forever. So if they ever want to show their kids or if anybody's like, you know, who's that guy? Well, you know, they can go watch the video and kind of see their story. Yeah, it's always nice to hear somebody's story, especially if it's interesting. You know? Yeah. So, but uh, I don't have anything else for you. Yeah, man. Cool. I thank you. I appreciate you being a good friend to me. So, yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Uh, We're going to do the smack. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <We're going. laughs> All right, man. We'll see you guys. Appreciate All it. Right.